Hi, I'm Debbie Levine. I'm the Senior Deputy Editor for Radiology, and I'm here today to introduce the August podcasts. Our first podcast is going to be done by Dr. Kressel, speaking with Dr. Andrew Trout, talking about use of clinical data to predict appendicitis in patients with equivocal ultrasound exams. I'm an ultrasound person. I love this paper. Um, next, I'm going to be doing a discussion with Dr. Vandana Dialani, um, and we're going to be talking about prediction of low versus high recurrent scores in estrogen receptor positive, lymph node negative invasive breast cancer based on radiologic pathologic features comparison with Oncotype DX test recurrence scores. Very interesting discussion about whether we need this extra Im um, extra test that adds cost without necessarily adding benefit for predicting how patients will do and whether they need chemotherapy. And then finally, we have a conversation between Dr. Madoff and Dr. Nahum Goldberg, who are going to be talking about IRE versus RFA, a comparison of local and systemic effects in a small animal model. So we hope you enjoy the spectrum of podcasts in our August radiology, and I hope we'll uh, be seeing you soon. Hi, this is Herb Kressel, editor of Radiology, and welcome to our podcast. Uh, today, I'm joined uh, by uh, Dr. Andrew Trout, Assistant Professor of Radiology and Pediatrics at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital uh, and the University of Cincinnati. Uh, Dr. Trout with colleagues have reported a uh, provocative study on the use of clinical data to predict appendicitis in patients with equivocal ultrasound exams. Uh, now, you may recall that uh, uh, in many centers, the equivocal ultrasound is immediately followed by a CT, and these authors uh, sought to uh, look at the use of uh, clinical data to help guide uh, further explanation, uh, exploration. So, uh, Dr. Trout, welcome. Welcome Thank to you. the podcast. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm glad to be here. So, uh, in your study, you use a structured reporting system for ultrasound of the appendix. Uh, can you tell us about it? And do you use structured reporting for all pediatric ultrasound exams? Yeah, so we um, do take pride in using structured reporting for the vast majority of exams that are done here at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. We have an elaborate set of um, standardized reports that we use. Um, the Structured reporting for appendicitis is the most advanced of those in the sense that it's the one that we have the most experience with and the one that we've done the most analysis of to know how we're doing with the reporting. Um, and the advantage of the structured report as it's set up is that it allows us to categorize um, all the data that we think is important regarding the appendix, secondary findings, uh, diameter, those sorts of things. And then we have set it up so that we try to tie our radiologists into one of five impressions. Now that's not to say they cannot elaborate on those, but we like them to try and stick with one of five impressions, which we know have um, certain predictive characteristics for the presence or absence of appendicitis. I see. Now you also looked and evaluated two different clinical scales uh, for the diagnosis of appendicitis, the PAS scale and the Alvarado scale. Uh, can you briefly tell us about these and how are they used at your institution? So these are clinical scores that have been studied in the literature and essentially what they are is they were derived to take into account clinical findings, so physical exam findings such as right lower quadrant tenderness, migration of pain, those sorts of things, as well as the laboratory values that are typically obtained um, when assessing for appendicitis. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to try and provide the clinical provider with a, an assessment of the likelihood of appendicitis. So these are designed to be used when a patient is initially evaluated in the emergency department to then guide further management from that point forward. These scores were developed actually in adult patients and they've since been extrapolated down to pediatric patients. When they were originally described, they were described to be fantastic and work very well. Subsequent um, analyses have shown them to perhaps not work as well as originally thought. So there are several studies that have come out and shown that they can be very useful in terms of helping to point patients towards either further imaging or nothing further or potentially even straight toward the operating room. So here at Cincinnati Children's, 
the way that they're used is kind of variable. We do have a algorithm that we have worked with our clinical colleagues in the emergency room and in surgery, whereby they are supposed to obtain a pediatric appendicitis, or that's the one that was selected to be used here because there's the biggest body of literature for that in the pediatric population. And the idea is um, that they will score the patient according to that score. And then based, if the child has a low score, theoretically, they're supposed to stop. An intermediate score, they might go to further imaging. And a high score, they would go straight to a surgical consultation without imaging. This is great in theory. Um, the problem is it is sometimes difficult to implement in practice because um, not every patient gets scored adequately. One component of those scores is labs, and not every patient gets labs because people don't like to stick kids with needles if they can avoid it. Um, so I would say it's intermittently applied here. Um, and then as far as whether the guidelines in terms of what you're supposed to do next are rigorously applied, I think that also is intermittent as well because a lot of latitude is given to the clinicians. Um, if there's something that sort of hurts them a little bit or bothers them, they don't necessarily have to abide by the scoring scheme. Now, I, the uh, whole question about using clinical data, for many uh, over the years, the thought of not integrating clinical data into interpretation of an imaging exam is unthinkable. In fact, we, uh, in our department, are we working to get more and more information and uh, not to use less and less? So, in your study, you're trying to see if it actually added anything in these equivocal cases. So what was the actual rationale? Uh, it would seem to be obvious that it should help. Well, that's, that's exactly the point, is we all believe strongly that incorporating clinical data can help us with our interpretation of imaging. And, and as you say, we're all trying to get more and more of that. So a couple of points I want to make here. As I said before, the, the scores were have been described to add value in stratifying patients toward imaging, but there's been sort of very little study of, can we then bring those scores back in on the back end to help us with our imaging interpretation, right? They can direct us to imaging, but what we wanted to figure out is, can we bring them in there on the back end? And yes, when we're looking at an appendix ultrasound in a pediatric patient, we'll look at the record and we'll look at, you know, does a patient have a fever or a white count? But our goal was to try and make this a standardized process, not just sort of how you weigh something versus how I weigh something, but can we bring them in at a very standardized process and improve our diagnostic performance in an in a algorithmic way. Okay, so uh, what actually did you do in your study? Can you tell us uh, what you actually did? So this is a retrospective this study, which is the biggest limitation of this study, and, and it would bear following out in a prospective manner. But what we did is we had a data set of patients that had gotten PAS scores, or pediatric appendicitis scores, um, as part of another study. And then we have, because we do the standardized reporting for the ultrasound, we have this huge body of data on those patients. And essentially, we brought the two groups together and pulled out the subset of patients that had both a PAS score and an appendix ultrasound. And we looked at the performance of the appendix ultrasound in isolation, the PAS, and then the Alvarado score derived from that in isolation. And then we went through and built the algorithm where we essentially looked at, pulled out the subset of patients with equivocal ultrasounds, and then went through and tried to apply the clinical scores to those and see if we could further stratify those. The end goal trying to be, instead of simply saying this is an equivocal exam, is there a subset of those equivocal patients that then we can pull out and say, these are going to be clearly negative, these are going to be clearly positive, we don't need to do anything more. I see. Yeah. And what did you find when you looked at your data set? Well, unfortunately, it wasn't as dramatic as we had hoped it would be, in the sense that we were hoping that, you know, maybe this would obviate um, further study in a large proportion of these patients. The biggest problem seemed to be there wasn't a great positive predictive benefit from applying these scores. That is to say, in that equivocal subset, the scores did not do that great in terms of saying this patient does have appendicitis. Um, however, there did seem to be some negative predictive benefit. That is, in, a, in the subset of patients that had a low score on either of those scoring schemes, schemes there seemed to be some ability to exclude appendicitis in that population with reasonable negative predictive value, 80 to 90 percent, depending on which scheme you use. Uh -huh. Okay. So what about CT? Let's get back to the beginning. Uh, what is the role for CT in these patients? In the normal algorithm, equivocal ultrasound goes directly to CT, uh, but you only obtain CT in 37 percent 
of those that had initial equivocal ultrasound exams. What happened to the other 63% of patients? Right, so the classic algorithm that's been described, and this is actually even being turned on its head a little bit with the advent of MRI, um, the classic al algorithm that's been described is get an ultrasound, if you can do it, and then do a CT in the subset of patients where you're not sure about your diagnosis. The idea there is you reduce radiation exposure to the population as a whole, and that's been shown to be very effective diagnostically. Mm -hmm. um, at our institution, we have an extensive experience with appendicitis ultrasound. We have great techs here who do very good exams, and so we can get quite good positive and negative um, predictive value from appendicitis in the vast majority of our population, and so really it is only those equivocal subsets or the subset where the appendix ultrasound outcome doesn't match the clinical findings where the patients go on to CT. That said, not all those patients will go on to CT because, again, we're one piece of the puzzle. Um, we're putting the, the ultrasound result as being included in sort of the whole clinical picture with the lab results, the physical exam, the surgeon consult, et cetera. So there may be a subset of patients wherein we say this is equivocal, but on exam, it's really not that concerning um, and so they will just watch those children um, either in the ER or admit them for a short period of time or, frankly, might even discharge them. And, and so that's basically what happened to the other almost two-thirds? That's where the, the other, yeah, two-thirds um, got shunted off. Now, we are currently actually looking at, at our overall appendicitis program here to try and um, look at our negative appendectomy rate and determine if perhaps we maybe should be using more CT even than we are. Um, there was some data that came out of, I believe it was out of the, the Netherlands, um, where they mandated CT um, as a follow-up to negative or equivocal mm -hmm. ultrasounds. Um, and they actually found that that had benefit across their population in terms of avoiding negative epinephrine. So um, we're looking at things now. It may be that we don't need to be so skittish about CT. Um, and that's a whole broader discussion, <laughs> which we've done time for. Now, uh, one sort of finding that kind of caught my eye was that the stratification accuracy using the clinical scales, that is, uh, you know, how accurate the clinical scales were in these equivocal patients, was worse when the appendix was actually visualized than in cases where it was not. And uh, do you, it just seemed sort of counterintuitive, I would think. Do you have any explanation for this? You know, I don't, um, and it, it's, that's a little bit of a difficult question. Again, once you get into that equivocal population, it's getting smaller and smaller, so there may be some sample size effects there, um, which would be difficult to tease out. It's also, you know, while we have standardized reporting here, we don't have standard criteria necessarily that dump patients into one category or another, so there is some radiologist um, personal experience or personal decision making that goes into whether you assign someone equivocal or not. So maybe non-uniformity in terms of how patients were assigned to one category or another may be contributing to that. Maybe the non-visualized cases, um, and again, it's not just all non-visualized cases. Um, a non-visualized case with no other findings in the right lower quadrant is a negative case. Right. Um, it's a subset of non-visualized cases where there's something else down there, maybe some fluid or echogenic fat, and maybe people are a little more aggressive about calling that than they should be. It's, it's a little difficult to tease out. Okay. Now, another uh, kind of potentially important finding, uh, which you alluded to, was that the low uh, clinical scores could potentially be used to further uh, reduce uh, the imaging exam stop as a basic uh, hard stop. Are you, have you incorporated the clinical scores in this fashion, or it's still sort of a matter of individual judgment? So at this point, we haven't formally incorporated them. That's part of this ongoing discussion as we're sort of reviewing our entire appendicitis program as a whole, is how are we going to incorporate them? One key point, though, if, if you think back, though, I said we have that algorithm here where um, in the ER and with our clinicians, if the patients have a low score, you know, they should even go to imaging in the first place. And so maybe it's a matter of really filtering those patients out in the first place. It would be false positives that right. we can hold in inappropriately. And right. so there's work, I think, to be done on both ends in terms of how we might continue to utilize these scores sure. um, in, the, in the interpretation. 
The well, last thing I want to just kind of get your view on, and in your discussion, you sort of note the high diagnostic performance, and you say it's due to the clinical experience and skill level that you all have achieved, but also you relate it to the use of this kind of standardized structured reporting. Uh, and how actually do you think that the standardized reporting contributes to these results? Uh, in, in several ways, I think. Um, part of it contributes based on the fact that because we've been using the standardized reporting for so long here and we have so much data in terms of how our performance is, our clinical colleagues are very comfortable with the interpretations that come out in the categories that we've defined as positive and negative. And so there's, um, there's, and we're comfortable with what at this point is a positive or a negative case. I think one other key point um, is that here at our institution, if we do a right lower quadrant ultrasound, even if we don't find the appendix, if there are no other findings down there in the right lower quadrant, we consider that a negative exam. And that's not the case if you look across the literature at a lot of other institutions. Okay. I don't know about many people, but some people still consider that an equivocal result. And in our opinion, and if you look at the data from our institution and from a few others, the negative predictive value of that type of exam is still quite high. And so if you consider those negative that's boosting your negative performance of the exam as a whole. And I think that's an important thing for people to recognize. A well-performed exam without any inflammatory change really is a negative exam. That, that appendix is small. It can be hard to find sometimes. Okay. Well, very good, uh, Dr. Trout. I want to uh, thank you for taking the time to uh, speak to us about your uh, fascinating study. And uh, we look forward to hearing more from your group. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Hi, I'm Debbie Levine. I'm the Senior Deputy Editor for Radiology, and I'm here in the Radiology Editorial Office with Dr. Vandana Dialani. Hello. Thank you. And we're going to be talking about her publication coming out in the August issue of Radiology that's looking at Oncotype DX test to see if we need it um, in the prediction of low versus high recurrence scores in invasive breast cancer. So welcome again, Dr. Dialani. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Can you tell us a little bit about what you did and what you found? Uh, so in early stage breast cancer, specifically the ER positive uh, breast cancers with, uh, which are lymph node negative, um, there is always a dilemma whether these patients should get chemotherapy. Um, these patients are usually treated with uh, hormonal therapy and um, so the clinicians fall uh, back on taking this decision by doing a oncotype um, test or a recurrent score test. Um, and there are several of these uh, out there, uh, but uh, the Oncotype DX is more commonly used, and that's what's used in our institution. And this test actually gives us a number, um, and the clinicians use that number to counsel patients. Now, the study was undertaken to see if we can predict the score based on uh, the general information that we get in every cancer diagnosis. And so, um, Every time um, there is a diagnosis of cancer, these patients get imaging tests like the mammogram and the ultrasound, and in some cases, the MRI. And they also um, get, um, when we do a biopsy, they also get hormonal testing, and we get the ER, PR, and the HER2 status of the tumor, as well as the grade of the tumor. So our aim was to see if we put all of these factors together the imaging appearance as well as the um, the report, the histopath report that we get on every tumor to predict the recurrence score. And um, so that was basically the aim of the study, was to compare the our prediction score with the prediction given by the Oncotype uh, DX recurrence score. And what we found is that um, there are certain imaging features that um, fit in and have a great correlation with the Oncotype DX recurrence score, especially the high score. So um, when we looked at our imaging features, and we did, um, um, the way the study was designed is any patient who had a Oncotype DX recurrence score um, done in our institution and had at least one imaging study done um, qualified for, um, the, uh, for the study. And so um, we, collected all these patients for over a five-year period. There were about 319 patients uh, which were included in the study, and um, not all of them did have all the tests done. Um, majority of them had a mammogram and an ultrasound, and about a third of these patients had an MRI done. And what we found on the ultrasound 
uh, and the, the factors that we found that correlated uh, with the high recurrence score were um, on mammography, it was um, the well circumscribed masses, which were oval in shape. Um, on MRI, it was again the well circumscribed masses, which were lobulated in shape. And on ultrasound, um, cancers which had high, uh, which had increased vascularity and which had posterior acoustic enhancement were um, correlated with the high score. And when we put this together with the receptor status, um, the patients which were low ER positive, the patients which were, um, the cancers which were PR um, negative as well as HER2 positive were uh, correlated with uh, the high recurrence score. And obviously the higher grade cancers were correlated with the high recurrence score. So putting all that together, if we predicted the recurrence score, it was, um, uh, we, we had a sensitivity of about 89% and a specificity about 83% um, predicting the score accurately. And when you look at how the Oncotype DX performs, I think that was pretty similar to that, correct? That's, um, that's correct. And so we were pretty close, at least in terms of the uh, prediction of the high recurrence scores. And when you did your um, study, and correct me if I'm wrong, you looked at the characteristics on imaging, but you looked at each imaging test separately. Um, so the ultrasound and the MR and the mammography were each independently looked at. Um, why did you decide to do that instead of combining features on the different modalities? Um, the reason being is that um, A, not all of the patients get all of these studies together. Most patients do get the mammogram and the ultrasound. Not all of them get MRI uh, evaluation. And uh, the way the BIRADS um, lexicon is designed is separate and different for ultrasound versus MRI versus mammography. And we um, we had at least two radiologists, or two breast imagers, um, dedicated breast imagers, look at the features on mammography, ultrasound, and MRI separately. And that's why uh, we decided that it was not a combination. And that's pretty much how every study is read and a BIRADS is given. It's uh, individual on the mammogram, ultrasound, and MRI. And we wanted to see if there were any specific feature with every imaging test that correlates with the high score. So you describe on mammography that it's that ovoid and on MR that it's lobulated and when I read that I got confused because it seems to me a shape is a shape and why would it be different on MR and mammography? Can you explain that's, that? That's a great question actually and it is a little bit confusing and uh, I'm glad we bring this up here. Um, when we um, did the data evaluation and when the uh, breast imagers evaluated um, each study separately. We used the BIRADS for ATLAS, um, which was being used at that time. And based on the BIRADS for ATLAS, um, a lobulated mass on MRI is, um, uh, it's described as lobulated when you see a oval mass with lobulated margins. And that is categorized as lobulated. Whereas if you use a, uh, you know, after that, the BIRADS 5 ATLAS came in, when um, they, they've actually omitted the shape lobulated because it's a little bit confusing and um, the lobulated tumors are included in the oval shape. So had we evaluated our data using BIRATS-5 ATLAS, all of these lobulated cancers would be categorized in the oval category. And so it pretty much, um, uh, it explains that all well circumscribed oval masses are associated with a high recurrence score. So then I, I can understand that a little bit better. So you've got a, a, an ovoid mass, and, and interestingly, that's worse than a spiculated mass, because usually you would think spiculated is bad. That's, um, yeah, and we kind of know that that um, from triple negative cancers, which are uh, which have a worse prognosis, most triple negative cancers will have um, well circumscribed margins and will have posterior acoustic enhancement. Um, and so this um, pretty much is parallel to what we know about aggressive cancers. So our our data showed that the 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 cancers which have a high recurrence score actually follow the same pattern. They're more circumscribed and they um, they have increased vascularity and they show posterior enhancement. So do you think there might be in the future, if you decide to use this, a, a benefit to combining those features? Um, or do you think that each individual feature, it doesn't really matter because you're saying the same thing, it's well circumscribed, it has extra vascularity, it has through transmission, that's the bad actor. It, um, no, uh, combining all of these features definitely um, is the way to go. Um, 
the limitation of our study was that we did not have every patient getting an MRI and just um, looking at the features, um, the cancers which are highly vascular um, are associated with increased uh, recurrence score and so um, you know, when we when we relook at the data, if every patient had an MRI, we would probably find more features with MRI that we could correlate with the increased um, recurrence score. And so um, that's another study that we're planning that to look at, so, because when our when we collected our data, that was data from nine two thousand nine to two thousand thirteen. And so now, typically, there are more patients which are getting MRI. More of our oncologists and clinicians and surgeons are getting MRI. Um, on on cancers, um, so we probably have a better cohort of uh, patients who will um, fit for that study. And um, obviously, we need a more multi multi institutional study to to validate the data that we have. And um, have your own findings changed uh, the ordering of that Oncotype DX test? Um, no, I think um, everybody's probably waiting for a larger multi institutional study to make that change. And um, in, in part, I think the clinicians feel more comfortable counseling the patient when they have a number. Um, to counsel, and they can say if the Oncotype DX score is less than 18, it's a low recurrence score, you don't need chemotherapy. Whereas the Oncotype recurrence score is more than 30, you need chemotherapy, and then you're left with the intermediate group. But um, the message is basically that even if you didn't have the Oncotype DX, recurrent score, which is an expensive test, it costs $4,000, you still have all the data which is there um, present in your routine um, imaging tests as well as the, um, the histopathological report that you get. And you could decide from that that, yes, this patient fits, um, is going to probably have a high recurrent score and is going to need chemotherapy. Um, and again, it, w it was not surprising to see the results because if you look closely at the Oncotype TX recurrence score and how it's calculated, um, there is um, a lot of weight, um, uh, in, even in this recurrence score calculation, um, to the ERPR status and the HER2 new status, um, and the um, and. We use grade, but um, generally the recurrence, the Oncotype DX recurrence score used the K167, um, which which determines the proliferation factor, and it's pretty much the same. Um, so um, it's not surprising that the results are comparable. And could you imagine a subgroup where we could actually use this on right now? For example, speculated, poorly circum circumscribed masses, whatever the imaging modality. Would you feel comfortable now saying, don't do that test. Um, I think if um, if there is a cancer which is um, um, low AR positive, PR negative, HER2 um, positive, and um, has a well circumscribed margin um, on any imaging modality and shows increased vascularity and posterior enhancement, um, you can predict that this is going to have a high recurrence score and um, probably will not need the Oncotype DX test. Great, so what are you doing next in your lab? Um, so as I said, we plan to do a larger study um, comparing Oncotype DX testing um, and uh, comparing the features with MRI. That's, that's the next step. Well, thank you so much for taking your time to join me today. I really appreciated hearing thank about you, your thank study. You, thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Dr. Levine, for having me here. I would like to welcome you to this podcast, which will discuss an interesting article being published in the August 2016 issue of Radiology entitled Irreversible Electroporation versus Radiofrequency Ablation, a comparison of local and systemic effects in a small animal model. I am Dr. David Madoff, the Deputy Editor of Radiology for Interventional Radiology, and I am joined today by Dr. Nachum Goldberg, who is Professor and Vice Chair for Research and the Unit Head of Interventional Oncology and Image Guided Therapies in the Department of Radiology at Hadassah Hebrew University Medical Center in Jerusalem, Israel. Welcome, Dr. Goldberg. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Uh, for years, uh, physicians treating tumors with ablative technologies thought they understood their therapeutic effects. That is, treat tumors locally to avoid local progression of disease and tumor recurrence, and also to improve overall survival. 
However, in recent years, there has been a tremendous interest in systemic effects caused from these local therapies. Can you explain how and why systemic effects can be caused by such a localized therapy, such as thermal ablation, and in general, are these systemic effects considered a good or a bad thing? Well, that is a compound uh, question, David, but let's try to take it piece by piece. It is indeed true that we've always concentrated and thought about our therapies as being local, and that's one of the reasons why people have always thought of therapies such as ablation and, for that matter, transcatheter mobilization as a local therapy. However, one must take into consideration the fact that we are not working in a vacuum. We're part of an organism, and the organism always interacts with any of the insults or therapies that we are trying to accomplish. Meaning, if we heat a tumor and the surrounding tissue, the body is going to try to react to that much as the body would react to heat stroke or some kind of sunburn. Yes, that's an excellent point. Um, so in, ge in general, though, uh, would these be considered a good or a bad thing, having these systemic effects? Well, the short answer is that we are very early in our understanding of these systemic effects, but we are certain that systemic effects occur. If one critically reads the literature, we'll see that there are many types of effects, some of which will be good and some of which will be bad. There are effects that can stimulate the immune system to cause many effects that will enable the body to fight cancer better. And by the same token, there will be inflammatory effects that could potentially activate or aggravate cancer either locally or at a distance from the tumor that we're trying to treat. Okay, thank you. So. There are now many ablative technologies available, which include radiofrequency ablation, microwave, uh, laser ablation, chemical ablation, uh, cryotherapy, uh, SBRT, high-intensity focused ultrasound, and irreversible electroporation, or IRE. Why were RFA and IRE specifically chosen for your study? Well, I think you're hitting the nail on the head, uh, David, because once it has been established that there are systemic effects of the therapies that we use, the next logical question is, are there differences between the different types of techniques that we have in our armamentarium? And therefore, we chose for this study to select two with two different methods of ablation. RF ablation and microwave ablation work by heating and coagulating proteins, whereas irreversible electroporation works using an, a different mechanism, a mechanism of opening up the cell membranes to cause uh, apoptotic cell death. So we chose two very different types of ablative therapies to ask the question, are there differences in the types of systemic effects that one can get? So, as far as um, other types of ablative therapies, would you expect there to be differences uh, from RFA and IRE in such a study? The fact that there were differences and marked differences in our study in outcomes, both locally in the inflammation surrounding the zone of ablation and in how the different tumor models uh, reacted, both positively and negatively, to answers with other energy sources. And indeed, one of the next questions that we're trying to answer, and something that will hopefully be appearing in the very short term in radiology, will be looking at other energy sources, such as microwave ablation. Okay, great. So one quick uh, issue that comes up, and this um, revolves IRE, is whether it is uh, truly a non-thermal ablation or is there uh, some thermal activity. 
Thank you for alluding to one of the uh, papers that we were fortunate enough to uh, also publish in radiology, where we noted that there are conditions in which IRE can produce heat. However, for this study, we purposefully applied doses of IRE that only used non-thermal mechanisms, as the underlying premise of the study was to determine whether or not that type of damage, meaning non-thermal damage, also causes um, systemic effects. Okay, great. So what was the uh, overarching hypothesis to be tested in your study, uh, and what uh, work led to this hypothesis? We basically asked whether or not there was going to be any difference in the extent of systemic effects, local inflammatory effects, and the mediators of those effects between these two ablative energy sources, RF ablation and IRE. What caused us to originally think about this was indeed the fact that there are undoubtedly systemic effects from at least some of our ablative therapies, such as RF ablation, something which has been fortunately published in radiology over the last year. Okay, uh, so what was done to test your hypothesis and what was found? We performed a series of experiments. The first of those was to compare the histopathology of the zone surrounding the ablation between IRE and RF ablation. The article that I alluded to previously in radiology by Rosenblum et al. very elegantly showed that there was a host of inflammatory cells that surround the ablation um, with RF, being populations of macrophages and activated myofibroblasts, for example. And we sought to determine whether or not there were any differences between RF findings and findings in normal liver after being ablated in IRE. Once we found that indeed there were differences morphologically, particularly the fact that many of these processes were going into the area of necrosis rather than just surrounding the necrosis, which occurs in RF, we started to ask other hypotheses in terms of what was causing this. We looked and determined that there were blood vessels that were persistently patent in IRE, and then we performed experiments to indeed show they were patent. We then, as a third study, looked to determine whether or not there were differences in the cytokines, the chemical signals that would be associated with increased cells within the ablation zone, and indeed saw elevation of interleukin-6, which is something that we see in patients, as Joe Aaron Jerry and the Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, folks have shown, and then produced experiments with two different animal models, a model MDR2 knockout, which is a chronic cirrhosis model where mice produce cirrhosis and then hepatocellular carcinoma, and a second model where we implanted uh, BLMN hepatomas as xenografts on mice to determine whether or not RF or IRE would increase or decrease the tumors in those two models. What we found was extremely interesting. And that was the fact that in the MDR2 knockout model, the model uh, where one has cirrhosis causing uh, various hepatomas to form, there was actually an increase in the number of tumors uh, compared to untreated animals for RF and IRE, but a greater number of tumors, statistically significant, uh, increased number of tumors for IRE compared to uh, RF when we looked at tumors that were actually larger than three millimeters. By contrast, when we looked at the uh, BLM model, IRE actually shrank tumors greater than RF did, but both methods actually had an immune abscopic effect, reducing tumor growth more than the sham controls. Well, thank you for that explanation. Uh, it was a very elegant study, and to do it so uh, flawlessly was quite impressive. Uh, so what do you think led to the enhanced 
uh, systemic effects caused by IRE over RFA? Well, there is no question that the elevation in IL-6, uh, interleukin-6, uh, it is a cytokine that's associated with inflammation. Uh, that can definitely stimulate uh, tumor growth. There is another paper uh, published in radiology this year by Ahmed uh, et al., Muniba Ahmed, that shows that IL-6 interacts with CMET, which is a known oncogene, and increases tumor growth. Okay, great. Uh, so your study was performed in a mouse liver tumor model. Are, there, are these uh, systemic effects uh, a liver-only phenomenon, or can they be extrapolated to include other organ systems? Well, there is no question, uh, based upon data that we are currently working upon, and hopefully one day will be published uh, in potentially even radiology, that uh, there are other systems that can uh, see an increase in uh, tumor genesis. Uh, particularly, uh, we have published data in PLOS1 showing that kidney, ablation of kidney produces even more IL-6 than ablating in the liver, and therefore we see greater uh, tumor genesis in the kidney model. Uh, that w works well in concert with some data of Brad Wood's group and the NIH. And uh, there is no question that if one ablates a tumor directly, some types of tumor, that one can see increased uh, tumor genesis from the uh, production of these various cytokines from either the tumor cells or the tumor stroma. So these are obviously uh, studies done in animals. Uh, what are the clinical implications of your work? Well, the, the clinical implications are actually quite profound um, because one important message that we need to stress is that our systemic effects are really a double-edged sword. And what I mean by that is it is very important to stress that in some cases, these systemic effects can be to the benefit of the patient by creating a immune environment that will help minimize or eliminate tumor that may be elsewhere. On the other hand, there is no question that in some cases, the inflammation in the cytokines can be quite negative and cause increased uh, tumor growth. So there is quite a bit of clinical implication. The challenge for us, therefore, is to find out precisely what causes the individual patient to move with these systemic effects towards tumor genesis or towards immunogenesis and oscopic effects and find the right way to force the pathway the way we want, which is away from these tumorigenic effects, meaning finding appropriate therapies that can help block tumorigenesis and ideally even promote immune therapy. So how soon can these, uh, 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 how soon can these affect the clinical practice in patients undergoing these treatments? And what about combination therapies? Okay, so we need to divide this into two aspects, the tumorigenesis, which we want to eliminate, and the uh, creating obscopal uh, immune effects. In regard to the tumorigenesis, although the mechanisms are not completely worked out, um, one of the early things that we wanted to do was find drugs that uh, are available today that might actually be able to be used in patients. And it turns out that we've recently published in European Radiology um, a paper that shows that COX-2 inhibitors, uh, and COX-2 does interact with the CMET HDF, hepatic growth factor uh, pathway, can help blunt this tumor genesis that we've seen. Now, it's important to stress that there has yet to be a clinical study, although we are trying to design one, but theoretically, uh, there are drugs that are available today that within a year or two, we might be recommending to give to patients to minimize the unwanted tumor genesis. Regarding the immune aspects, um, there's plenty of potential, 
However, it's probably going to take a couple of years more of basic research before uh, those uh, concepts are going to be advanced enough to go into clinical trials. Okay, great. So this is a more um, clinical question in the sense of uh, clinical practice. So at this time, uh, most practitioners have either an RFA or microwave ablation device and also have a cryoablation device in their armamentarium to treat a wide variety of tumors. Uh, IRE is much less commonly used at this time. So given your findings, should IRE now be considered the ablative therapy of choice, or is this premature, such as if you were now in the market to purchase a device, uh, which one would you choose given the currently available knowledge? That is a very provocative and complex uh, question, but I will take that as an opportunity to stress another important point, and that is that regardless of the fact that we are now aware of the fact that there are systemic effects to our therapies, we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There is no doubt that interventional oncology as a discipline, be it on the ablative side or on the embolization transcatheter side that also has systemic effects, as the literature clearly shows, uh, despite that fact, we're helping a lot more patients than the number of patients that may be seeing this unwanted tumorigenesis. And similar to what was done with uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, where first the chemotherapy helped, but then they found thyroid cancers later on, we need to just clean up the negative unwanted uh, effects and maximize uh, the benefit. Uh, so microwave RF are definitely good. We can definitely help many patients with HCCs, with colorectal cancers, lung, bone, kidney, etc. Having said that, we need to acknowledge that there are organs and even settings within these organs that we can't help as well as we would like, uh, often due to the fact that uh, heat can damage nearby critical structures. And in those cases, this IRE, which is at this point the new kid on the block and at this point less validated with less experience, nevertheless, it may find an appropriate niche in appropriately treating um, tumors that can't be treated uh, using the standard uh, techniques. I view these techniques as complementary, um, not as uh, competitive. Okay, great. And lastly, uh, based on your study, what are the next steps being done by your group to advance our understanding of the systemic effects from the localized therapies? We've actually touched upon some of them. That's an excellent question. So clearly trying to understand the uh, differences between all of the ablative and transcatheter therapies in terms of the extent of the systemic or negative in terms of tumorigenic trying to figure out which organ systems are uh, most affected, going beyond the liver and the kidney. And most importantly, one of the things that we're trying to do is to get a better understanding of which cells are most responsible for these uh, tumorigenic and abscopal effects, uh, as well as which tumors and which tumor types are potentially most affected. It is quite possible that we will one day identify biomarkers um, such as CMET expression on the tumor cell or VEGF or something else uh, that will tell us these tumors are, have a propensity to receive the unwanted effects, tumor genesis, or these types of uh, tumors will have a better chance of an abscopal effect if we use combination therapy. Well, Dr. Goldberg, I'd like to thank you for joining me today on this podcast uh, to discuss your group's experimental work comparing irreversible electroporation to RFA in terms of the local and systemic effects in a small animal model. Uh, I thought that the discussion was very insightful and provocative and should give our viewers a good platform to understand the basis of these effects. Uh, we very much look forward to seeing your group's work in the future. Thanks. Thank you.
It's a pleasure being here. I thank you very much for the opportunity to express what we're doing now and hopefully for the opportunity to share with the rest of the uh, radiology community uh, many important insights in the future. Thank you very much. Great, thank you.